So watch your language. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I probably should get off of here now. I've had a bad day. <laughs> you had a bad day? <laughs> well, just little things. You know, just talk about it or, or? Oh, no, it's nothing that, no, nothing that drastic. It's just little things that kept happening that are irritating, like dumping the whole bottle of my thyroid pills in the sink while the oh. water running. <laughs> Oh, no, that's not good. I mean, it wasn't, it's not disastrous, and I could save them. I just had to dry them out before I could put them back in the bottle. Oh, so you did save them. Well, that's a good idea. Yeah, I did save them. Water out and drink it a little bit at a time. <laughs> <laughs> I did too. Yeah, that's good. How many teaspoons equal one pill? <laughs> yeah. So it's been two weeks since we talked, and I can't remember what we were talking about two weeks ago. Our uh, class factotum is not here, so I'm hoping someone else kept record. I did. <laughs> I did. Well, lay it on us. <laughs> Forgiveness. What does it look like? Are we obligated to forgive someone who doesn't want to be forgiven? And how long do we forgive before we start to look foolish? I added the last one in there. I was going to say that last one seems like you added that in there. I did. Okay. All right. Uh, let's go then. Let's start. I have to go to my magic looker upper. Magic looker upper. Matthew eighteen twenty one. Matthew eighteen twenty one. And twenty two. Eight, twenty-one. Eighteen, Matthew, eighteen, twenty-one, and twenty-four. All right, everybody there? Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Somebody read those two verses. Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, 77 times. Or seven times seven. Yeah, seven, seven yeah. times seven. Yeah, seven. Right. Uh, why would Peter ask him seven times? What's what's with that? How many times shall I forgive my brother? Up to seven times. A special perfect number. Why would Peter why would Peter ask him that? Hmm. Seven was the perfect number. And biblical numerology that does re represent the the perfect number. Uh, and the footnote in some Bibles says that the rabbis at the time taught that people should forgive, but only three times. So in saying seven, Peter's not only referencing this perfect number, but also like, I want to even go beyond what we're supposed to do. So when Jesus says 70 times seven, that means we can get to 490 and stop, right? No. Mm, I don't think so. <laughs> so what's Jesus, what, what is he really saying? There's no ceiling. <laughs> right, and that you shouldn't be keeping track. Forgiveness is a huge uh, topic in the Bible. Um, and you can look at it one of two ways. God's forgiveness toward us and then our forgiveness toward one another. And we're supposed to model our forgiveness of others on the forgiveness God gives to us. How does, what, 
how would you characterize God's forgiveness toward us? Just complete. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. Never ending. Never ending. Okay. Unmerited. Yes. Because we do not deserve it. Right. That's part of the grace that God shows us in forgiving us through Jesus is that we don't deserve it because we keep sinning. And we made that mention, I think it was last week in the sermon, we talked about God's patience with us. How we keep walking away and walking away and God keeps forgiving and bringing us back. So forgiveness then is also patient. God's forgiveness with us is patient. And it's a good thing I'm not God because I would run out of patience long before. <laughs> so we're supposed to model our forgiveness on God's forgiveness toward us. So that's what our forgiveness is supposed to look like to others. Okay. Uh, what else can we say about God's forgiveness toward us? Go to Psalm 103. Psalm 103. And let's start at verse 8. This is kind of talks about God's forgiveness. So let's say 8 through 13. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquity. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. Okay, so we're again we're talking about God's forgiveness toward us, so let's kind of go through this and look at what that looks like. Um, compassionate, that's one thing we can say. In his forgiveness, God is compassionate. Gracious, and remember, grace is giving us something we don't deserve. Mm -hmm. Okay? Forgiveness, eternal life, salvation. Slow to anger and abounding in love. How many of us are slow to anger? And then it says in the next verse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve. That's the definition of grace. Or repay us according to our iniquities. Um, this is the, probably the quality of forgiveness that we most have trouble with. Because what do we want to do? Well, the fact that we want to keep track of how many times the sins we have to forgive a person who indicates that we are not like God. We don't actually let it go. It's still there. Mm -hmm. We want to hold on to it. And we want to treat people, and we want to treat them the way we think they deserve. We want people to get what they deserve, right? Mm -hmm. But of course, that's in our estimation. Yeah, what we think they deserve. <laughs> right. Which is a good reminder to us never, ever, ever to pray for what you think you deserve. Right. <laughs> True. <laughs> you do not want God's justice. You want God's mercy. 
He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. I, I really like that. I, I say that as part of a prayer almost every day. To remove my transgressions as far as the east is from the west. Which is obviously very far. <laughs> um, and finally, verse 13, as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. Which brings up a really good point. The Lord has compassion on who? Those who fear him. So does that mean he does not have compassion on those who do not fear him? Is that the corollary? Good question. If God has compassion on those who fear him, and remember we talked about this, what does it mean to fear the Lord? We've talked about this on Sunday morning. What does it mean to fear the Lord? You see that in the Bible all the time. We just did a whole sermon about this, didn't we? I was there, wasn't I? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> what does it mean to fear the Lord? Respect come in there. Respect God for who he is. Near. Not fear him in the sense that God's going to hit you with lightning, but respect God for who he is and what he is. To acknowledge who God is. Okay? So, when we say, the Lord has compassion on those who fear him, who does he have compassion on them? On who does he have compassion then for? Those who respect him, those who put their trust in him, those who acknowledge who he is, and those who come to him. Okay? In other words, those that believe. Those with faith. Mm -hmm. It's also interesting that he uses uh, this imagery of children and father. Father and children, right? Mm -hmm. um, Go to uh, John, I think it's John 1, 12. Don't hold me to that. John 1, 12. Ah, it is good. All right, somebody want to read John 1, 12. Yet to all, yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or or a husband's will, but born of God. Right. So who are God's children? Those who believe. Those who received him. Mm -hmm. Yet to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. We are not born as children of God. We are born as children of Adam and Eve in the sin. Only those who receive Christ can call themselves children of God. Okay? So going back to Psalm 103, the Father has compassion on his children. So who does he have compassion on? Those who believe. Those who believe. Those who have become his children, adopted into his family. Okay? So again, let's go back to that question. A father, as a father has compassion on his children, the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. Does that suggest that he does not have compassion on those who do not fear him? Yep. <laughs> sounds like. That's what it sounds like. Hmm. 
<laughs> but well, he has he has enough compassion that he will accept them, to accept them back. Oh, absolutely. If they ask. And that's the point we also made the other day in Second Peter three nine. The Lord is patient, not wanting anyone to perish. Mm -hmm. But at some point, the patient runs out. The patience runs out. Mm -hmm. Do we believe that there's a hell, and do we believe that there are people that go there? Yep. Mm -hmm. so who goes there? And the non-believers. Non-believers, those who do not come to faith in Christ Jesus. So that would suggest that in that situation, God was not having compassion on them. Why? Because God is not compassionate? No, because they don't accept it. God requires one thing of us. Come to faith. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to turn here, but uh, I know you know this verse, Mark 3.29, where it talks about the sins that can be forgiven. <laughs> Whoever blasphemes, it says, Jesus yep. said, I tell you the truth, all the sins and blasphemies of men will be forgiven. That's compassion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. All the sins and blasphemies of men will be forgiven, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven because he's guilty of an eternal sin. And what is that sin? Unbelief. Mm -hmm. Rejecting God. Right. Turning away. So, so, if, so if you blaspheme and say you don't believe in God, but then you change your mind and start believing, then will you still go to hell? No. I, I like what it says in the footnote in my Bible on that. It says, Christians sometimes wonder if they have committed the sin of blaspheming the Holy Spirit. Christians need not worry about this because this sin is attributing to the devil what is the work of the Holy Spirit. It reveals a hard attitude of unbelief and unrepentance. Deliberate, ongoing rejection of the work of the Holy Spirit is blasphemy because it's rejecting God himself. Okay. Deliberate, ongoing rejection of God. The heart that is so hard, it cannot conceive of a God or a need to come to God. Well, see, and in the Old Testament, that was idols. They had a lot of trouble with any group that they came across that had idols. Well, we just changed our idols out. We have different idols today. True. Mm -hmm. So, I, I just like the way that's phrased. Deliberate, ongoing rejection of the work of the Holy Spirit is blasphemy because it's rejecting God himself. God cannot and will not forgive those who reject him. Well, and the first command. You cut out there, Marvin. Yeah. I, the first commandment. What about it? Well, what is it? There's only one. Only hold one God. Yeah, only one God. Yes. So, does this suggest that in order to be forgiven by God, you have to go to God and seek forgiveness? Yes, him or Jesus, which is the same as the same. Yeah. Does that make sense? Does anybody think something different? <laughs> if God forgave without coming to him, what would be the point why would we need Jesus? Mm -hmm. If God can and will forgive what we do without us ever having to come to him and asking for forgiveness, what well, Jesus did would seem we believe that you have to. We believe that you have to accept the Jesus' sacrifice. If you, I mean, we have to what? 
it's Jesus sacrificed for our sins. We right. believe that we have to accept that. And if we don't accept that, we just go to God or cut Jesus out, then we aren't we have to live by the law. Right. You're you're either living by the law or you're living through faith. Yeah, you have to. You have to you either believe in Jesus as the Son of God that gave the ultimate sacrifice, or you're bound to the law. Just you have to. But there, but there are people who see no point. There are people who are saying, "I'm not doing either. I don't believe in Jesus. I'm not coming to Him." And this law you're talking about, well, that's in the Bible, and I don't believe that anyway. So I see what you're saying. You're approaching it, though, from a perspective of faith. Look at it from someone that has no faith. If I don't believe in Jesus and I don't believe in the Bible, there is no faith. And there they is don't no have faith. any faith. What They don't have any faith in God either. Right. So, I mean. No, that's not true. All right. So if we're at the point where we say, God will forgive those who come to him in true repentance, right? All right. And we'll talk about that Sunday. Well, how about how about the religious groups that don't believe in Jesus, but they believe in God? Like the Jews, for example? Yeah, the Jews. Uh, the uh, the uh, oh, uh, Muslims. A lot of the Muslims don't. Muslims certainly they, don't believe they, in the same God that we believe in. Right. So what happens to them in terms of salvation? Yes. What does it say in Acts 4.12? John 14.6. Acts 4.12 says, No one comes to the Father except what? Through Jesus. Through Jesus. Through Jesus. John 14.6. Acts 4.12 says, There is no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. If we truly believe that, then we look at that and we say, you either, you either come to faith in Christ as a means of salvation, or you are lost and outside of God's salvation. And that's very hard for us to wrap our heads around sometimes. Because we want to believe in a loving God that would not certainly not condemn nice people like the Jews. Are the Jews still the chosen people? You know, that's the other thing. Well now you're now you're really getting going down the rabbit hole. <laughs> I know. It's but that's all together. But this is this is what makes this idea of evangelism so important to us is that if you do not have a faith in Jesus Christ as the Son of God, according to the Word of God, you are outside of God's grace and mercy and subject to wrath and condemnation. That's the way I read the Bible. I mean, that's what the Bible says. I'm not sure there's any other way to read that. Um, go to... Uh, Oh, well, we'll we'll digress here just for a moment. Uh, oh shoot, my concordance isn't fine. Go to uh, Matthew seven fourteen. Matthew 7, 13, and 14. Somebody want to read 13 and 14? Enter by the narrow gate, 
But the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter it by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow the road that leads to life. Who, what's the narrow gate then? Heaven. What's that? Heaven. No, no, what's the gate? The gate is the entryway, okay? Think of, think of an actual gate like being an entryway. What's the, what's the gate? Jesus. Right, it's Jesus. Jesus right. is the narrow gate. That means the only way to get to where you want to go is through him. Mm -hmm. So when he says, wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction and many enter through it, this is the idea that all roads lead to heaven. That your God is as good as my God and all you have to do is believe in something. This is the attitude, say, uh, not only in, pop, in our popular culture, but also in groups like the uh, uh, Unitarian Universalists. We basically say, believe whatever you want to believe and you'll get to go to heaven. That's the wide road. That's the way most people in our culture tend to think. Jesus is saying he is the gate and that gate is narrow. My footnote for that says, Believing in Jesus is the only way to heaven because he alone died for our sins and made us right before God. This does not mean it's difficult to become a Christian, but there's only one way to live eternally with God, and only a few decide to walk that road. And again, to many people, this seems really narrow and unfair, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Really? No. Not unfair. Not given the life that we've already got. <laughs> okay. Why is it the ultimate example of fairness? You know, critics say, well, you're just being exclusionary and uh, narrow and small-minded to say that your religion's the only way. But why is it the fairest possible way of all? Because everybody a chance. Absolutely. Everybody is equal in the sight of God. Everybody has an opportunity to come to Him. Everybody is welcome. Yes. Everybody is what? Welcome. Oh, Absolutely. We, we, met, we referenced uh, 1 Timothy 2.4 last week. God wants all people to be saved, to come to the knowledge of the truth. Everybody, not just some, not just the nice people, not just the few. He wants everybody to be saved. There can't be anything fairer than that. Everybody has the same opportunity. So to go back, let's circle back to where we were talking about forgiveness. So God being God wants people to come to him for forgiveness. He offers out in his compassion forgiveness freely to anyone who comes and asks for it, but you got to ask for it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You've got to come to him through Jesus. Okay. So again, does this suggest, as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him, that God does not have compassion on those who do not fear him? It yeah. seems to suggest that. And whose fault is that? The person himself. Mm -hmm. The people that reject God. Mm -hmm. It'd be like a parent giving a spanking to a kid and the parent saying, I'll stop, but all you got to do is say you're sorry, and I'll stop and I'll hug you and it'll all be over. No, I don't want to do that. <laughs> I'd rather take my beating. 
<laughs> and that sounds ridiculous, but that's the way some people are living their lives. Mm -hmm. Don't need God, don't want him. I'd rather, I'd rather take my chances. And there aren't those some of the people who say, well, where is God when I need him? Mm -hmm. <laughs> need him for what, though? To make my life easier for me. That's what God's supposed to do, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, to me that comes across as, why doesn't God do what I tell him? <laughs> 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 it's astounding. You know, you know, have you, you've heard that old saying, a little knowledge is a dangerous thing. Mm -hmm. I think a little of knowledge of the Bible can be extremely dangerous. Because people who have just a little knowledge of it have a complete misunderstanding and misrepresentation of who God is. Mm -hmm. And what he wants from them. And what he's about and the nature of their relationship mm -hmm. a lot of people view god as santa that you know he's there he's off in the background and then when i need him i call on him and he gives me what i want mm -hmm. so i'd almost rather run into somebody with no knowledge of god whatsoever than somebody that just had a little and by all means the worst place you can learn about God is television and the movies. <laughs> that is the definition of a little knowledge is a dangerous thing. All right, so we've got a picture here in Psalm 103 of God's compassion and forgiveness to us. So how does that translate into our forgiveness of others? First of all, what does it even mean to forgive someone? Well, forgive is to say you're sorry, but then the other part is forget. That's the hard part. How do I forgive someone that's done something wrong to me? What does that look like? Hmm. Well, I have to ask your forgiveness, first of all, because I don't think you can forgive somebody who doesn't care if they're forgiven or not. What about people who don't realize offending you or hurting you? Okay, two really good points there. Let's take the second one first. What about people who don't realize they hurt you and don't see the need to be forgiven, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I would think that comes on you to go to them and say, you know what? You did something that really hurt us and bothered me and i'm wondering if we could talk some stranger you never see it yeah i was gonna say why do you have to go to stranger well, you know someone that does something that they didn't realize that hurt you or offended you and you never see that person again it's just been passing can't you forgive that person i'm trying to think of a situation where someone would do something in passing that was like well, it doesn't have to, does it, you forgive somebody, does it have to be major? Oh, I, I'm, I know, I'm just trying to put this in terms my, I can wrap my head around. I mean, just why do you have to go to somebody to forgive them? You can forgive them anyway, right? You don't have to go to someone. I think the question is, do we need someone to come to us in order to forgive them? Does someone need to ask your forgiveness? in order for you to forgive them? Or do we just forgive people whether or not they ask for it? I think in some cases you can just forgive without them asking. Mm -hmm. I do too. Okay. That's the turning the other cheek part. Yeah, it's just that you have to yeah. realize you're asking for forgiveness when you should offer it to other people. Mm -hmm. I'm still trying to put this in concrete terms. I always like a, to 
put it in a picture I can see in my head. Somebody's done something to you. Well, it's kind of like don't hold a grudge, right? Grudge? Yeah, it's kind of like. You know. Okay. Jesus on the cross said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Oh, I like that. Mm -hmm. I really like that. Mm -hmm. So he was forgiving them, even though they didn't know that they had even done anything wrong. Right. Boy, that's really good. Mm -hmm. So if someone's going to crucify me, I should forgive them. <laughs> yep. <laughs> So no, that now see that puts it in terms I can understand. I like that. So yes, that seems to suggest that people can do things to us that they don't know that they've done something wrong, and we can still forgive them. Well, in that case, who is forgiving all the Jews, right? The Pharisees, the Sadducees, and so forth. On one step. I think it was the, everybody that was involved. Yeah. Romans to the, the Jews to. Hmm. Okay. I think I think the Pharisees was like they were doing wrong. I'm not sure that yeah, the Roman sure. soldiers that were ordered doing what they were ordered to do realized they were doing wrong. Yeah, I was going to say that. Is that let's, go to, let's go to that uh, you know? section of scripture here. Uh, <laughs> Trying to remember what gospel is. Uh, go to Luke 23. Okay, Luke 23, verse 34. And there's the verse we were just talking about. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Uh, my footnote says, Jesus asked God to forgive the people who were putting him to death. And God answered that prayer by opening up the way of salvation even to Jesus' murderers. Now, if those people in the crowd who had put Jesus to death, who had done this thing, had not later come to faith and come to repentance, would they have been forgiven? Jesus asked them to forgive them. Jesus did. He asked the Father. Can you ask, though, for, to, for forgiveness for someone else? Jesus is praying for the people there, right? Mm hmm If the people say, you know what, this guy's crazy, this is nuts, I'm not doing this, I don't see no need to do this, and they just walk away. Does God, in fact, forgive them? If they don't ask for it? Or is Jesus rather praying in the sense that God give them the opportunity to be forgiven? Because it still comes down to our That's individual. Praying for, I think that they understand someday what they have done. Because unless they understand what they've done, that it was wrong, they'll never ask God's forgiveness. Okay. 
that's the point I was trying to make. Let's say they never understand what they're done and they never ask for and they never ask for forgiveness. Does God forgive them? Hmm. Well, I don't is, Jesus, know. is Jesus rather praying for God to work in their hearts so that they will come to understand that they're sinners and eventually come to relationships? Well, some of them did come because the uh, Christianity actually start was started by the Jews, so you have some there that did. And then they spread it to others. Right. And it's not in this gospel. I think it's in John where uh, the centurion, remember, said what? Surely this was son of God. Son of God. Well, the other thing I hadn't really been familiar with, I guess, was where he says, says it here in Luke, it's not like wherever the other gospel is. When the two thieves, one of them asks for forgiveness and the other one doesn't. What about the two thieves? One uh, one asks for forgiveness and the other doesn't. This right. Man. Yeah, and, and that's so interesting that that's the very next part after, after Jesus said this. Mm -hmm. and, and look at the next verse after, after Jesus says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Then they divide up his clothes. But look at verse 35. The people stood watching and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, he saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Christ of God, the chosen. So does that suggest that they were ready to come to repentance and be forgiven? No. The soldiers also came and mocked. Yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't the thieves. One of the criminals hurled insults at him. So I'm wondering if Jesus is what he's praying there. His father, give them the opportunity, change their hearts to see what they've done, that they may come to you in repentance and seek forgiveness. Hmm. Give them the opportunity to be forgiven. Which is what Jesus was doing for all of mankind by his work on the cross. So that's the same today. The opportunity to be forgiven is there. Do we take that opportunity and go with it? And that's the question for all people. That the opportunity is there. You either take it or you don't. You either come to repentance or you don't. You either receive forgiveness or you don't. We read in Mark 3.29, the sin that can't be forgiven, blaspheming the Holy Spirit. It sounds like the people here are blaspheming the Holy Spirit. Even right after Jesus said, forgive them. Jesus is offering them that opportunity. Who's the only one who takes it in verse the one. 2? Thief on the cross. Mm -hmm. Criminals. One of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the thief, right. All right, so let's go back to our forgiving others then. How do we, first of all, how do we forgive someone else? What does that mean? What does it even mean? We know we're told to forgive others. Jesus told us to forgive others. Well, you, you forgive somebody, you're not for this wrong and that wrong. And wipe you call them up on the phone and say, I forgive you. Wipe it out. thought is if you if you try to forgive someone but the hurt is still there that's is that wrong okay you want to forgive someone but the pain is still there mm -hmm. 
So are you saying if the pain is still there, you really can't forgive? Right. Yep. But if the person did it on purpose, then... can you forgive someone and still have ill feelings for them? No. Can you forgive someone and still feel poorly for them? That's my question. I'm restating it. <laughs> I'm throwing it out there. Wait, sir. Can you feel badly towards someone and still forgive them? My, I don't necessarily like still feel badly for them. I don't feel badly about them, but it tends to wear away at my trust in that person. Because I can forgive them, but do I, I mean, knowing the kind of person they are, that if they don't change, then how am I going to know that they're not just going to keep doing it over and over again? So I, is there a way to forgive but still be wary that you don't get? Yeah, I think what you're saying is that they undermine your trust to the point that I don't know whether that's complete forgiveness or not, but you know, if somebody steals from you two or three times, they're really kind of foolish to get a hundred dollar bill to go buy a pack of candy, you know. <laughs> Keep the change. Yeah, right. <laughs> that but that yeah, but that's it. You know, how do you 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 keep Letting people, you know, have your trust and they keep abusing your trust. I mean, when do you start looking like a patsy? You know, oh, yeah, well, we'll go over there because she forgives everybody. And she'll give anybody anything she want, they want. So, uh, there's another question Can we forgive someone but not trust them? Yeah. Here we, I, I believe we can. But you're supposed to wipe the slate clean. Well, what's that mean? You don't have to have anything to do with them after that. That's right. Do you think God in the Old Testament trusted the Israelites to do the right thing? To do what? Did God in the Old Testament trust the Israelites to obey him? Didn't, they, didn't he know they were going to? Right. Time after time after time, they told them to do something, and what did they do? They didn't do did the opposite. Did the opposite. So it would be hard for me to believe that God trusted the Israelites, yet he kept forgiving them. But there was always one or two that he trusted that he went through to to get back to get them back to. He had certain people that were right. that he could trust. But even Moses let him down that one time. Yep. I think what this comes down to in some sense is trying to separate feeling and faith. Too often we get them mixed up and we base on our faith on how we feel about it. That is, well, I don't feel very kindly to him, and he hurt me, so I'm not sure if I'm forgiving him or if I can forgive him. I think Marvin was, was right in the sense that you can, I think you can forgive someone without having anything you do, want anything to do with them. Now you tell me. What are you talking about? <laughs> you know, sometimes uh, it depends on who you're forgiving, too. You know, if it's a family member, if it's a All right. stranger, you know. Well, the classic example of this, remember, is Corey Ten Boom, the 
Dutch woman who survived the Holocaust, mm -hmm. horribly mistreated by the guards, one guard in particular. And years later, after she got out, she was able to go up to him and say she had forgiven him. Now, did she feel kindly toward him? No. Nope. Probably not. Did she want to hang out with him and be his best buddy? No. Probably not. We, we too often confuse and conflate feelings and faith. We, we can forgive in spite of our feelings. And sometimes feelings push us in the wrong direction because it's your feelings that say that person hurt me. I can never forgive that person for what they did. And I'm sure she felt that way at some point. And the only way she's able to forgive is the only way any of us are able to forgive is by the power of the Holy Spirit. Not based on how we feel, but by how God works in us. I can't imagine being able to walk up to somebody that had done all those terrible things to me and say, I forgive you. We obviously have just kind of scratched the surface on this. We're at a natural stopping point. Do we want to uh, continue more on forgiveness next week? Sure. Yeah. All right. So everybody go out and do something that you would be forgiven for. <laughs> we'll do that and then we will come back and talk about it. Okay, well, uh, I, believe, I believe you pushed that past the point. Right there. Well, I, it's, a, I, it's a, uh, well, what do you call it? A, a real life experiment? <laughs> so, anyway. All right, we'll continue to follow up on this and talk about forgiveness and maybe think of some instances and people in our lives that hurt us and, and needed forgiveness and how we were able to work through that all right oh good. i got a good story for that one well, write, it down <laughs> so I don't forget. write it down <laughs> write it down so you don't forget we'll write remember because we oh, want to hear it <laughs> oh it's yeah it's really good <laughs> all right good to see everybody yep good to see Happy you <laughs> hopefully we will see you soon Yes. All right. We'll be there. Until okay. then. Bye. Bye. Bye.